How you doing guys? I uh, just wanted to give you a quick little video lesson so you can uh, have this to refer to later on um, so that we can uh, talk about the novel, Pride and Prejudice. And so you have some uh, frame of reference. I'm going to share some uh, resources with you, uh, some websites, and also kind of go through a little PowerPoint so that you can have a good idea of what it is we're going to be looking at with the novel, what you have been looking at, and what you should uh, look at moving forward. So here we go. Um, Pride and Prejudice, um, by this point, you are pretty far through the novel. You are at least done with uh, volume one. You're moving into volume two. So um, a lot of the stuff uh, should be familiar, both based on what you've read and uh, what we've already discussed. Um, we've already looked at a little bit uh, how there's a transition from neoclassicism, and we talked about uh, Jonathan Swift, a little bit of Alexander Pope, and I mentioned Pope just because Pope kind of uh, represents the idealized poetry that we see with neoclassicism, uh, the heroic couplet, the return to the epic poem, um, a lot of things that uh, were common in Greek and Roman uh, literature uh, resurfaces again in neoclassicism and Pope was um, uh, widely considered, considered to be the, uh, the master of that particular art form. Uh, Jonathan Swift, we've already read. Uh, we read uh, Gulliver's Travels, and you, you know all about that and how he used satire uh, to, to critique uh, British society. Um, so let's transition from that into uh, romanticism and the, uh, the different things that happens, uh, social values, cultural values, uh, economic and, and politics, a lot of changes happening. Um, all over the place in terms of the, uh, well, just the, the, the culture in England. Um, we had the Industrial Revolution happen, and that meant uh, we have uh, the population is shifting from the rural countrysides to the, uh, the city centers, and uh, that's where the jobs were, and that usually means that you have um, other issues and other problems that go along with that. Um, Though this novel doesn't really talk about that that much. Uh, this novel focuses more on uh, the, the more rural, the more countryside, um, and it deals with a lot of the class structures in terms of what is going on in romantic England at the time. Um, so romanticism as a movement, um, if you read carefully in the introductory section, uh, you, you notice that some of the aesthetic qualities and characteristic of romanticism uh, kind of sounds similar to what we talked about in American literature with the American romanticism. Uh, romantic art, romantic literature, romantic music, all of that has uh, more to do with uh, more aesthetic qualities, more emotional, um, more, uh, in a sense, more primal. Um, you can think of music like uh, Beethoven uh, and how emotionally driven that was compared to music by someone like Bach or Mozart even. Um, so romantic music, um, you do see a shift into a more aesthetic, more emotional kind of uh, a sense. Uh, romantic art, kind of the same thing. And both of those categories, can uh, we can have long discussions on that. And I'm sure in other classes and other schools and other places, there are long discussions. You can take uh, college courses, you can even major in some of these different things. We're going to focus on uh, the romantic literature, um, very briefly the poetry, and then we're going to focus most of our attention on the prose, which is the long form of literature. All right, so uh, romantic prose, the novel, and the novelist. Um, before we get into that, just the, uh, the romantic poetry. Um, again, when we have Alexander Pope writing in the neoclassical form, he's kind of returning to the, the classical forms of Greek and Roman uh, poetry. Um, there is still a lot of formality to romantic poetry, but it does, um, again, it's a little bit more emotional, it's a little bit more uh, primal and aesthetic, uh, and not, uh, not focusing so much on the form or the structure. Um, so, um, romantic prose, a novel, and the novelist. Um, so novels, as we see, uh, become more aesthetic as well. It makes sense since romanticism is a little bit more aesthetic as well. Um, in, in case you're wondering, aesthetic uh, in this particular context, we're meaning um, it has a, a very specific and direct appeal to the senses, um, especially uh, the, the appreciation of how something affects uh, the senses. Um, usually this means in terms of 
uh, sight or smell or taste um, uh, or sound. But um, in terms of reading a novel, the aesthetic sense means that it applies to uh, how we feel about a novel or, or the feelings that it gives, how we interact with the characters in the novel. Uh, so there's definitely an, an emphasis on emotional experiences because with a novel, um, you don't only really have pictures to look at. It's just a bunch of words. So you're not going to get a really kind of visual reference. You're going to have to go with um, either your imagination or just how you visualize things based on the text. So the emotions become a little bit more meaningful to uh, the reader of the novel and, of course, to the novelist itself. Uh, we saw a little bit of emotion with Swift, but he was more focused on the satire and the settings and the context and all of that other stuff that we looked at before. Um, Jane Austen and some of the other novelists, they really do look more towards the aesthetic, the emotional experiences, and depend more heavily on that to convey the narrative and the meaning of the story. So uh, what is the human relationship to the natural world? Because that really helps us understand um, emotional experiences in the in light of romanticism. So it's more intentional than incidental. And by incidental, it kind of means um, there's no purpose to it. Um, intentional means that there is specific attention given to uh, the relationship between humans and the natural world. Um, it's more meaningful than it is mechanical. It means our participation, as it says here, our participation in the natural world is more active than passive. So we don't just happen to be in the natural world. Um, or the natural world just isn't just something there to, to uh, support us or to interact with. Um, as we saw with Gulliver's Travels, he was, um, he was just there in the setting of wherever the, he was in the novel. So in Romanticism, um, it's more meaningful than that, that there's a, a closer relationship, a more direct, more personal relationship than it is uh, uh, with well, with humans in the, in the natural world. Uh, and then, of course, more experiential than contextual. So when you have uh, the emphasis on emotional experiences, it is the experience that um, helps us inform how we understand the world around us. Uh, and not just that uh, it's the context of the world. For instance, um, a, a novelist in Romantic England writing about the city of London uh, is going to write about the experiences of living in London, not, not, not just saying, here's a city, we all know what a city's like, um, and it's there to provide context for the story, for the narrative. Uh, there's going to be a lot more of the emotional and the aesthetic experience tied to uh, giving London as a setting for the, the novel or the story. Um, <clears throat> so moving on a little bit more in, in romantic prose, what we see is a, is a shift in uh, in a sense, in gender roles, the emergence of, of, of female of female and women authors, uh, you have Jane Austen, you have Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, you have Charlotte Bronte writing Jane Eyre, um, and these were three of the, the novels that we have today that, that probably uh, are widely considered to be the most representative of English romanticism in terms of the novel. And there, there's two here, Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre, that are very similar in style, very similar in approach. Uh, Frankenstein is completely different in a lot of ways. Um, and that really deserves its own attention. And there's some attention we can give to that later uh, when we get closer to the end of this unit. Um, the importance of the female perspective and the contributions of the female voice. Um, this is a, a time when the role of a woman is really supposed to be uh, staying at home, raising a family, taking care of the household. And uh, we see a little bit of those concerns with Mrs. Bennett in the novel. Um, her concerns are very focused on the future of the family because there are no male heirs uh, to take on the Bennett name. And uh, well, the Bennett name also comes the Bennett estate of Longbourn. So when we look at um, outside of the context of the novel and Jane Austen writing it, um, you get a, a sense of a society in which uh, if women are not really able to have a voice of anything, how is it that's become well-known or even famous authors? Um, and a lot of times it has to do with taking on pen names or writing more or less anonymously or um, having the assistance of someone who's very well connected in the publishing business 
uh, in order to kind of get these novels out. Now, uh, one of the things that I like to observe about these female writers is that um, because they are female, because they are women, that they have to be a little bit, they have to be that much more careful, that more, much more precise um, regarding how they write and what they write about. So if you read any of these novels, you'll, you'll recognize that they're, they're very precise in their language. And it's not just because that they're fantastic writers. It's because that they are uh, essentially holding themselves uh, to a higher standard uh, by default based on the society that they're uh, a part of. So when you have these women uh, writing, it's, it's important to notice that what they're writing about is from a, a female perspective. Uh, for instance, Elizabeth Bennet is the main character of Pride and Prejudice. And of course, um, Jane Eyre is the, the main character of Jane Eyre. So these two women have um, a different perspective than a, a man would have because their participation in society is a little bit different. Um, actually, a, a lot different. So having these women be the, the title characters and, and the central characters of the novel is actually a really important thing to observe. So when we're reading Pride and Prejudice and we're seeing Elizabeth, one of the things that makes her such a profound character is that um, she's really different than what she is uh, supposed to be, I guess you could say. And, and that's because she's not just going along with what she's supposed to do. She's kind of um, having her own thoughts and having her own opinions. And today that doesn't seem uh, all that odd by any means. But when this novel is written, when it takes place, that is uh, a tremendously uh, scandalous uh, position for a woman to take. Um, and so what we see here with romanticism really is the emergence of uh, female writers to a, a very public uh, stance and public uh, position. Uh, and that kind of carries over today. Um, so major themes in, of Pride and Prejudice, uh, like I mentioned already, we talked a little bit about um, Elizabeth and the, the female voice and how um, the, the perspective of Elizabeth and the perspective of, of uh, Jane Austen and how Elizabeth is different than what she's supposed to be, how that plays into the the narrative of the story. So some of the other major themes of Pride and Prejudice is of course social structures. You look at how uh, Mr. Darcy acts, how Mr. Bingley acts, um, how Mr. Bennett acts, and they're all kind of within their stratification and where in their social status. Um, and they're kind of stuck there. If you saw the video that I put regarding uh, social status and wealth in, in Romantic England, then you have a better understanding of that, um, it's the link is in the the end of this PowerPoint slide. If you'd like to take a look at that again, um, but then when you have social structures, you also have like Mr. Collins, who's kind of uh, doesn't really fit anywhere, and yet um, he does have a, a strange, a uh, strangely influential position over the Bennett family. Um, so when you're looking at social structures, it's definitely um, taking to task or pointing out some of the um, glaring. I guess flaws we would call them uh, of the the social structure of England in the 1800s uh, of the Romantic period, uh, and especially taking a look at the roles that wealth has in in determining social status um, and how that is um, maybe the primary, if not the only way that someone can have social status or even social value, uh, as we see again with Elizabeth who's very intelligent, has uh, a lot of opinions, and has a very uh, robust personality, and yet she's not really valued all that much um, for any of those qualities. In fact, a lot of those qualities kind of work against her for a large portion of the novel. Um, so again, the social structures are really important, and we're gonna follow those all the way through the novel, and that's really kind of the point I think John, Jane Austen wants us to get out of that one. Uh, marriage as a social contract is another theme. Uh, the idea of how a wife is chosen is, is very important, very critical to understanding the novel. Um, that's one of the things that makes Elizabeth such a controversial character uh, in the novel because um, she does not go along with any of these conventions. Um, if you read any of the context, if you followed along, then you understand that um, marriage is a, a social contract means that it's it's not uh, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not 
the girl or the young woman is in love or even likes the man. And sometimes um, they had never even met until the marriage is arranged. Um, and sometimes the, the man could be much, much older than the girl. And it just depends really on the arrangement that the man who wants to marry and the father of the girl, uh, what kind of arrangement they have between them. Um, and that really is the, the only thing that determines what, uh, what happened. And that ties into social structures uh, because uh, a family of a certain caste or a certain strata or, or a certain position can only marry within that position. Um, very difficult and very uncommon for anyone to marry outside of that particular status. And so um, in a lot of ways that helps secure the wealth of the, the wealthy. Um, and it also kind of put some strain on some of the, the less than wealthy. Uh, and uh, in, the con in the contextual the section of the, the textbook, you saw that there was uh, some information there about the, the landed gentry um, and some of the other, uh, not noblemen, but the other people who lived in the countryside um, had titles, even had lands and estates and houses, but didn't really have that much money. Um, and that was one of the, the problems that faced some of the families. It's definitely one of the problems that were facing the Bennett family. They weren't poor, they weren't broke, but they weren't extremely wealthy and they lacked the, the male heir. And that caused a lot of the tension because of the way that the social structures were arranged. Um, and then lastly, we have social obligations versus personal desires. And this um, is, is focused mostly on Elizabeth and to an extent to Mr. Darcy um, because they both have obligations to their particular social class and they don't really do anything uh, that they're supposed to do for much of the novel um, and that's kind of the clash it's the internal conflict and to an extent the external conflict between or, or for both of these characters um, because their personal desires and their social obligations are um, at odds for much of the novel and how they figure out what to do and what they decide to do um, really kind of depends on which side they're going to choose. Are they going to choose their social obligations? Are they going to choose personal desires? Um, and the fact that these two elements are, are not in agreement is, is uh, commentary in and of itself. All right, so um, here are the links. Again, this PowerPoint will be posted on the Edmodo site, so you can take a look at that, download it, take a look at the links. We're gonna take a little bit, uh, a look at some of the links right now, just so we can get a sense for what, uh, what we're dealing with here. So um, here is an article by Encyclopedia Britannica talking about romanticism and the romantic period. Um, as you can see, it, it talks a lot about some of the stuff and talks about the, the poetry a lot. Uh, so you can get a sense of romantic poetry uh, as opposed to just getting a sense that all, yes, there's a lot of ads, but um, that's just the way they format their website, I guess. Um, and so it's, it's pretty extensive and this should provide a lot of assistance to you in understanding the context of romanticism in terms of uh, literature, specifically here the poetry and how that really underlays uh, and informs our uh, understanding of the transition from neoclassicism to poetry or to uh, romanticism. It's the poetry that's going to be one of the the links that we that we have between those two movements um, because those are two of the more noticeable uh, in addition to some of the stuff we've already mentioned. So you have that list here. You have a whole bunch of stuff happening on the side here. So it's not a short article and it's going to be pretty helpful, pretty informative to you as you uh, try to get into the context of the novel. Um, the second site I wanted to share with you here is um, by the British Library. So pretty, uh, pretty authoritative take here. And it's just talking about social realism in the novel, um, an overview of sorts of Jane Austen and how she's writing her novel and the impact and the influence that uh, her society has and her impact on society. Uh, it's kind of a, a mutual uh, impact there. Um, so you can take a look at all of this stuff. I think all of this would be very helpful. I found it pretty helpful in understanding some of the, the aspects of the novel. 
and uh, hopefully that's that's pretty helpful to you. Um, so make sure that you are keeping up on your reading and uh, that you have any questions. Make sure you're asking those questions so that we're not left in the dark. All right, so that is our overview and context very briefly for Pride and Prejudice. And again, um, this is basically understanding that you've been reading and that you have a lot of knowledge already based on that reading. All right, so this is just to fill in the gaps. This is not to answer any major questions or anything like that. So if you do have those questions, uh, save them for me and ask them at another time. All right, so hope you guys have a great day, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.